Welcome to another episode of Earth 2's This Week in Comics episode. As you all know, we've been doing something for This Week in Comics where we're highlighting um, black comic book creators for the you know, for Black History Month. And last week we had Ruben. And for those of you that listen and support it, I want to thank you very much for listening to that episode. This week we have a very, very special guest, a uh, uh, an accomplished uh, comic book creator, someone who's really accomplished in the game. Robert Roach, uh, go ahead and talk, uh, introduce yourself, Robert. Greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Robert Roach. I live in the Los Angeles area. In addition to comics, I work in the entertainment industry doing storyboards, concept art, these types of things. Uh, done that for the last couple of decades. In addition to that, and the comics, I also teach at Otis College of Art in their extension program. I teach a quick sketch, perspective, storyboarding, these types of things, and dabble in a few other things, but nothing illegal. All right. Nothing illegal. <laughs> okay. As you all know, This Week in Comics is run with myself and Ziggy. Ziggy, go ahead and say what's up. Nice to see you guys, like always. Uh, hopefully we do a good show this weekend. Yeah, Go hopefully. Away. Yeah, hopefully. Hopefully I won't let you down there. <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> it's more. It's more of us <laughs> than anything. Right, right, Hope right. Uh, and special guest who you know from our uh, what's the name of that show? Runaways, Runaways. Um, discussion group. Brianna, Brianna, go ahead and say what's up to the uh, Earth Two Comicast people. Hello. <laughs> All <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so as you all know what we do on This Week in Comics, first of all is we highlight what we've read in the, you know, this is usually a bi-weekly, uh, Robert, this is a bi-weekly episode, so we usually highlight okay. what we've read, you know, in the past couple of weeks, or what, you know, not necessarily read, what caught our attention, what caught our eyes, okay. you know, what, what, you know, what we think we're going to read, or what we've been reading, you know, leading up to the episode, so it may have been a story we've been catching up on. Yes, pretty much, so. Uh, you're new to the show. Myself and Ziggy, we run the show, and we've been doing it for a couple. We've done a couple episodes. We even did one for the end of last year, which is really interesting. But um, you're new to the show. I'm going to assume that you read some comic books on the side. Yes, I do. Okay. So, is there anything in the last month, month and a half, couple of weeks, even in the last year, or anything in particular that sparked your interest that you've seen and you said, "Hmm, this is really interesting." You got into it, and you know, you were you weren't wrong. One thing that I would like to highlight is uh, Noble, which is by uh, Catalyst Prime, Line Force people. Nice. Uh, I must say that I'm biased <laughs> because uh, I'm well acquainted with the writer, Brandon uh. Thomas, and I'm, I say I'm good friends with the editor of uh, the whole Catalyst Prime line, Joe Illich. So I am biased there, hands of the artist, and so uh, I've been picking up that. And what I really like about the storyline is it's not just a superhero. It's not just people of color. It's a couple. Mm. And uh, within the storyline, even though the husband is heroic, and well, I guess initially he's anti-heroic, uh, but in terms of being capable and just kicking much ass, it's the mm -hmm. wife. And uh, I love, you have to go back to last year to get the, the first few issues, but the uh, issue two, when she realizes that uh, her husband is, isn't dead as she had been told, and he's pretty much lost, and as we find out later, he's uh, a bit amnesiac. Um, the, the final frame of that issue as she's leaving her son with uh, her grand with his grandmother is I'm going to get daddy and I'm like yeah okay go handle your business girl so <laughs> it, it's it's worth a look and more and more nowadays since I'm an indie I try to pay more attention to indies or uh, stuff that the principal shop owners may not pick up okay uh, I think it's only fair if I expect that kind of love. Um, I should give that kind of love. I 
I don't think me not picking up an extra Batman or an extra X book or uh, an extra Spider Man or something like that is going to bankrupt Marvel or DC or Disney or Time Warner or whatever you want to call them. So uh, I- I'm trying to pay more attention to this type of stuff. Okay, okay, that's that's awesome, and I really appreciate that. So on the show, usually on This Week in Comics, anything that we highlight, anything that we talk about, we're also recommending. So do you recommend this to the listeners? Do you, are you telling them to go pick this oh, up? Definitely. I, definitely. Uh, Noble, um, uh, there's, man, it's slipping my, I want to say Supreme. Uh, another line by then, I'm really trying to follow Catalyst, follow Catalyst Prime because I know a lot of the creators there, okay. and they're not, they're getting uh, critical of, but they're not getting what I think they should in the broader community because we get stuck. We you know we're all guilty of this unless we willfully tell ourselves not to. We, we buy what we've always bought, right? And um, maybe what we've always bought isn't the best thing. And so I am trying to follow those books I mentioned. Uh, uh, Supreme, and I hope I get it right, or else, because if I don't, Ray Anthony's going to kick my butt. <laughs> but a friend of mine, Ray Anthony, uh, is uh, drawing that title. And so uh, I know some of the people who are doing stuff there, and, and Ray's done stuff at DC Marvel, so it's not like it's not like he sucks and somebody threw him a bone. Right. You know, like, the brother's very, very talented. And so, you know, like you see Ray A. Height on a book, you know it's going to be good. You see Brandon Thomas's name on a book, you know it's going to be good. Uh, they're getting really good reviews, but somebody will go out and pick up uh, a Justice League copy rather than their book. Great example. Um, I can't remember, Mukhtar, if I sent you the link to uh, the review that meant through my comic. Yes, you got. did. You did. You know, if if you looked at some of the other books, you know, like, I'm not mad, uh-huh. but somebody else pointed out to me, I, I noticed it before, but someone else pointed out to me that my review was the only one that didn't have the cover artwork on it. Yes, this is true. Yes. This is true. I was like, let it go. I'm glad that Newsarama actually wrote something about us. That That's a big coup. I yes, mean, it is. If you're talking about the comics industry, you know, you have CPR, Newsarama, and Bleeding Cool who are at the front of that pack. There are others in the pack, but they're at the front of it. And for them to spend a paragraph on an indie that has been produced black and white uh, is is a is a big thing. And so love they loved Hannibal Taboo's story. The Hannibal a shout out, my boy working at uh, the Operative Network, um, and. I was pleased that they gave us the love, but there's something else that I noticed that uh, was really, really cool. Um, they gave us seven out of ten stars. Yes. But that Justice League story in there, they only gave it five out of ten stars. Uh, Justice so League we, is suffering. Hey, and people still buy it. As a reader, Justice League is suffering, and I read Justice League, so I can tell you that. On you know it's on a personal level, I right, yeah. So and we smoke, and because you know what was cool about it, uh, I, I apologize for for jumping, but no, 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 I'm not. Right. I'm still on your line, man. But uh, what was cool about it all is um, the criticisms about our publication, mainly about the fact that the work wasn't inked and it wasn't colored, and some of the lettering obscured. The artwork. Well, right. we're planning to ink it. What they saw and thought was the final, final product is simply part of the process. Uh, Larry Welch has already inked the first three pages of uh, the first chapter. Uh, Corey Green, my colorist, has the flats, and so he's going to start playing around with the colors. So they gave us seven out of ten. But the merits for the stuff we haven't done yet, after we do it, what you gonna give us then? Ten out of ten. I can imagine. <laughs> I can imagine that once you know, you know, the, the I read it. The only drawbacks, like you said, like you highlighted, was the inking 
and the coloring and you know the lettering i read it and i thought those were nitpicks if anything because then again it may have been because you sent me you know the you know you in the email you sent me you said um you know this is something that is going to happen so i'm looking at yes. it like this you know this is a nitpick again you know someone who doesn't know you know wouldn't understand yes. wouldn't understand so i can't really fault them for that but uh thank you for I'm your mad at them at all. yeah I'm yeah mad at all. yeah so but thank you for it, the I'm sorry. It was interesting that that one, the two things that we are going to address were the only things they could say. You need to address this. <laughs> right, right. No one came for your story. No one came for anything else. It was literally just that. They said the artwork was detailed and really cool. The story, the the story's flow was fine. All right, cool. All right, fantastic. Thank you for your recommendation. So it was supreme, mm -hmm. and it was supreme and. Noble. 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 All right. Fantastic. So and, there, and there are a lot of other Catalyst Prime uh, books out there that you should consider. And, you know, I, I'm not trying to slight anything else. Okay. Uh, there at the front of my head. Uh, a couple of their books are on my nightstand. So uh, you ask me what I'm playing around with. That's what's playing around in my head right now. It's okay because down in the comments, uh, down in the uh, description box, I'll let you guys know what those books are again. And we'll try to get you guys links to, you know, where to find them. Uh, Brianna, are you reading? Have you read? Are you, you know, catching up? Is there anything you want to catch up to up on something you're reading? Um, I just read a comic adaptation of Octavia Butler's novel Kindred. And that was really uh, cool. Yeah. And it was really sad. Uh -huh. But I, I really liked it. Um, this does manga count? Because I just picked up a manga that I'm excited about. Sure. Manga sure. is, I mean, it's not just, we're not just talking about um, comics, American comics here. Oh, well, not good it. stuff. Yes. So if you want to drop it, go ahead and drop it. So I haven't read it yet, but it's called Cells at Work. And it's like, it's a the first main character is a blood cell. And so it's basically oh. in the body. And they're, oh. they're like delivering like carbon dioxide, carbon carbon dioxide and like oxygen and so I'm really excited about it but I just really that like that really yeah biology and comics that's interesting that's definitely interesting Ziggy as you... an aside as, as an sorry. aside um, my friend John Jennings grew uh, Kindred and um, his his writing partner who's also a friend uh, Damian Duffy they uh, collaborated on the adaptation and it's just don't don't fool or anything because it's out of love. I'm missing their premiere tonight at a museum about uh, black uh, comic art and stuff. I am uh, so sorry. They just, no, they just know it's their fault. They sprung that on me at the last minute saying that it was going to happen. I said, no, I got things to do. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, Ziggy, do you want to go ahead and talk about yours or do you want me to go first? Because I feel like you have a list. Uh well, I got three. I'm just going to go with three okay. uh, to keep it controlled. Um, so the first one is I, I'm, I will, I'm a Marvel boy. So uh, the first one I uh, will point out is I read this week was X-Men Red. Uh, obviously, Jean Grey is back, and I know how much like fans of like, like Marvel and X-Men are so groaning, being like, she's back again. Can we please... <laughs> Just stop repeating the story, which I agree with. I definitely agree with. But she is a character that I do enjoy, and if it's going to be, if she's going to have to come back, I'd rather it be written a good story than a bad story. Right. So, so if we're going to go through it, uh, like let's make it a good one. So she's back, and I'm very interested. Um, it very seem it's just the start. Um, she's the start the team, and it's just basically it's. It looks like I hope it's going, and so far is it looks like their writers looking to really address like the world that we live in now and uh trying to like address that this is a very very like it's a we are in a crazy point in time that history is being made and things are happening and it's really interesting to see if they're willing to like see how far they go into it because if we all know the x-men the original start it was supposed to be like something addressing what the political turmoil and what was happening in america yes. at the time and it's good to see that, and I think that's been lost over the years. Yeah, uh, it's fun. X Men is still always supposed to be fun, but at the same time, I, I really enjoy when comics are willing to like connect to people and really embrace what the people are feeling, and that's the whole point, right? We want to see what we feel, 
reflect in comics. So I'm hoping that first issue is just a start, but we'll see how that goes. Um, that one I enjoyed. Uh, Mo will like this. I well, I don't know if he specifically like this, but uh, I I enjoyed a DC comic this week. Yes, Crazy. finally, Crazy. finally, <laughs> it happened. I said Super Sons. Um, yes, and it's inter- interesting. I've already talked about this one this week is uh, the Mother Panic Batman special, and nice. I haven't done too much of the young animal stuff, but I. I, I know what it is. I know it's kind of like DC's kind of like gives writers a little bit more free reign to write whatever the comic, which honestly, that's always what I enjoy is writers write the story that they're, they want to write, not the story that like DC or Marvel heads are, are only allowing them to write. Because I feel like when you, ha- when you have someone telling what you can or can't write, that it kind of kills the whole point. Um, so Mother Panic, uh, I haven't read too much of, the, of that series, but they did their their special for DC that doing their like Milk War special, which is kind of crossing their young animal lines with their uh, main properties. Mm-hmm. Um, I enjoyed it. Um, it was really interesting to see how a kind of a, a, a like a young writer, like a writer who doesn't have like all these kind of limiters to write a, a story that they want using Batman, which doesn't happen too often. Right. Um, right. I am putting him as the like see him be saved by a hero that's not well known. It's kind of cool and interesting to see. So I really enjoyed that. Um, and then uh, last one is for me my indie. I'm always the indie. I'm telling you, the indies are the best stories right now. Uh, <laughs> is uh, Grave Diggers Union. Uh, Union. Um, it's by Image. It's Wes Craig uh, and Toby Cypress. Um, I really enjoy this one so far. It was an interesting start. It's a have like this idea is like this world where like kind of the supernatural is a a part of society and this grave digger union is kind of like he defends the world from it and it's kind of like this interesting approach to kind of treat the supernatural as anything else if it was real here we would have to deal with like a job and how they have a union how that works and the like politics of it and really cool to see and i really enjoy it um not to give too much but like basically the main character kind of like is cool and he leads the team um, and hit it's he's been doing it for years, but uh, it seems to be some like some uh, like a cult is out there that is looking to change this world and how it is. And it looks like it's such an interesting stuff because it his daughter might be the antagonist of the story. So it's kind of creating that interesting like thing where it's like you get to see where like I think I will really enjoy is I want exploring how how they've gone so different and what happened because there's obviously there is love, but there's also anger between the uh, the father and the daughter. And you can see it's interesting. We can start as they're both going through their adventure in the world and how they're building up their like faction or side. You also get to explore what's been happening, what happened in between time, like why they have their reaches apart. So I've been enjoying that one so far. So uh, I'm ho- hopefully that one keeps going and keeps doing this thing. But those are my comics. Really. That's cool. That's very fantastic. You know what's funny? Um, you're talking about you read uh, something at the Young Animal line, you know, the um, Milk Wars. I actually picked up um, JLA and, uh, um, um, was it JLA and Young, you know, was it Young? Doom Patrol. Animal? Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, JLA and Doom Patrol uh, last, this week. So that was pretty interesting. I thought, again, like you said, it's something where, you know, diff- you know they, they handled these characters different. It was Vixen, the Ray, um, Lobo, uh, um, what, Killer Frost, Superman, uh, you know, all different iterations of these, you know, really ingrained characters. So, you know, it's a, it's a writer taking these characters that have, that have been ingrained and doing something different with them, especially, especially mixing it, um, mixing them with the Doom Patrol and that world, which is already psychedelic. So it's like taking these, you know, characters from their normal or regular and, and putting them in these, you know, in this uh, extreme or, or psychedelic world and, and just seeing how you can make things happen with them. I always think when DC or even when a major comic book uh, um, house does something like that, it's always interesting. You know, this is why I think the indies are starting to, you know, be a lot better and people are starting to read a lot more indies is because, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot less restriction on the art, on the writer and the artist. It's like you can do whatever comic book you want to do and however you can write it, however you want to write it. You know, it's like you want to write a Superman story, but you have to you know, write what, you know, in, in, in a way, or you have to write the story to go with, you know, what they're, you know, whatever the, you know, the, the, um, overall arc, you know, arc is like, if you're writing Batman, you have to write him in a way, if you're writing the flash, you have to write him in a way where, 
you know, you know what happened in Red Death has to kind of like line up into the Flash's book. So I like seeing when you know young artists or indie artists are given, or you know writers and artists are given something where it's like you know just do what you want to do. So that um, uh, Doom Patrol and JLA is something that I'm reading, and I want to read more of what's going on in that line. I actually did read an indie book this week, um, The Beauty. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> The beauty, uh, Jeremy Hunt, he's doing something really fantastic with that book, and it was, it's always, you know, when, um, uh, Vito, uh, told me about the beauty, I, I was like, all right, I'll pick it up, so I reluctantly picked up the first issue, and I ended up going back to pick up the first volume, so it's that good, and I want everyone to read it, because it's something, if I, you know, it's like a disease, or a sexually transmitted disease, where everyone becomes like a prettier version, or the prettiest version of themselves, so, but what you don't know is in six to eight months that um disease actually becomes you know kills you so people are anxious to get this disease like you know actors or actresses or waitresses or people who work in sales you know if if that's your career or if that's your platform you want to have the beauty because it's something that could push you into a better position in life but it's also are you yeah. willing to risk you know the disease or are you willing to risk um risk what you could get from that disease and you know they've, they've dealt with a couple of um issues they've dealt with the serial killer they've dealt with you know an assassin a uh, trans assassin you know they've dealt with so many issues that again with with the way the beauty is done it's done in a way where they're talking about social political stuff but it's also very you know it's also very comic booky you know it's like oh it's comic book but it's also very important because it's like oh the drug you know the drug or the medicine industry you know the medicine industry or, or the uh, pharmaceutical industry there we go you know they're all producing you know cures or cure-alls I and mean, you know instead of producing a cure-all you producing something that's gonna you know not cure you you know f to the full extent you know it's gonna keep you coming back to buy more medicine it's like exactly. why haven't we invented a flu shot that can just kill the flu why is it uh hundreds of years later people are still dying from the common cold it's like things like that wait, it the flu is because it mutates every year, which is why you need a new one every year. Well, this is something. Isn't it? Yes, it, it, it's. Oh, that it, is very is. That is the <laughs> truth. But it's also something that, you know, we can always plan ahead for. Why are we trying to catch up to it when we could. I really feel, you know, I feel personally, again, you know, someone, you know, who's in the sciences, I feel like there's stuff that we can catch up to. That we, you know, we're, I'm sorry, stuff that we can plan ahead for. I feel like we're playing catch up with everything. Or we're not being told the whole truth but yes you're right about the flu you know why are we still playing catch up with the flu as opposed to getting ahead of it again the common cold is the common cold mutating every year that we can't ca you know catch up and and get that get rid of that we just got rid of polio you know why can't we get rid of it? hey but you know it's whatever but the beauty kind of touches on stuff like that it's like oh okay well especially on this arc or this arc, yeah this arc right now we're dealing with the company of berico uh berry corp um they are producing a drug to instead of cure the beauty you know that's what they were trying to do was cure the beauty or that's what some of the scientists were thinking they were about to do was cure the beauty but they're instead they're creating a disease that or they're creating a, a drug that kills people faster or something i'm sorry i will go back and catch up to it you know i just started the arc so i'll go back and read it and catch up and on the next shot correct myself but those are the two that I really have been enjoying that I've been reading. And again, I just started the new arc of the beauty. So that is this week in comics. Now we're about to get into the main reason we're here is to talk to Mr. Robert Roach about his comics and why he got into, you know, what he's doing and, you know, everything else that he's doing besides comics. But um, I'm sorry, guys, before we go into this, I would like Mr. Roach, uh, Mr. Roach to tell us about. He's uh, my, my, Mr. Roach, Mr. Roach was my dad's name. <laughs> <and Robert. laughs> if right. you're 18 years old or younger, okay, Mr. Roach is fine. <laughs> Other than that, I'm, I'm just proud. All right. <laughs> Sorry about that. I like uh, Robert to tell us about his books, um, Menthu and The Roach, because uh, I have information about those, but it's always better if you know Robert, you know, goes ahead and you know describes not in. Um, De not in full detail just tell us a little bit about you know what those books are and you know yeah just yeah just tell us about those books uh well menthu's tagline is uh ancient egypt uh, slash uh modern la's ultimate action hero uh he's african-american uh but his dad 
turns out in the storyline is actually uh, ancient Egypt's god of war and um, machinations and politicking within that Egyptian pantheon from millennia past have culminated in uh, this father uh, siring a son and his initial goal was to help to uh, not necessarily uh, reincarnate but to bring back a friend of his uh, named Menthu who was uh, unjustly forced to uh, for lack of a better comparison commit seppuku and, and he has a chance to right this wrong he has a son and that's when everything goes out the window because he loves the sun, but this plan is in motion. Put that all to the side because that all happens before the first issue. That's the backstory. First issue starts off when he first realizes he has these powers. And after realizing that he has these powers, uh, what do you do? What's, what's the answer? And the answer is found in... in uh, the Tajus art, uh, ancient Egyptians equivalent of Olympus. So he goes to that underworld, and of course he has to survive a bunch of stuff, and uh, he finds out more about who he is, starts to mend fences with his dad, because uh, if I had been told that I was born just to be a vessel of convenience, I'd be pissed. And so... <laughs> They have to deal with that, and uh, and they do, and so that four issue arc ends, and then five through seven, he's back in L.A. He's doing his thing, and it's standard superhero fare, but not um, one thing that I don't believe the comics industry does well is tell and set story in L.A. Um, New York is fine. Marvel's New York out the ass. So, um, <laughs> you know, we, we can make up uh, fictitious cities like Metropolis and Central City and all these types of places, um, but folks still don't get it right. Um, there's still some comics set that are being done today set in L.A. that do not feel like L.A., um, for example, if you are on what L.A. calls the Miracle Mile, a lot of Art Deco, a lot of wide roads and old school buildings and all that kind of stuff, and you'll see somebody sets part of a story in Ed Wilshire or the Miracle Mile, and it looks generic. That part of the city can't look generic. If you're going to know anything about L.A., you know that you can go down a street for two miles and it's the most gorgeous place you've ever seen. Two miles further and you're middle of, in the middle of a war zone. Two miles further, you're in the middle of middle class. And then two miles after that, you're in another uh, exclusive area. That's just how the city is and all these neighborhoods laying upside each other. And the Korean community in LA is more populous than anywhere outside Seoul. People don't know that. That's why there's so much Korean in town. Uh, as far as Southern California is concerned, that still goes through for the Vietnamese community. It goes through for the Armenian community. It goes through with so many different communities. A lot of people think of New York as a very, very Jewish town, and it is. And it is. But there are more Jewish people living in L.A. than anywhere else in America. So, yes, so there are all, all these opportunities, storytelling opportunities, if you know the city well and can bring all of these people rubbing their elbows against each other and at the same time really blow up a lot of this stuff. Okay. Okay, that's awesome. And so Manthu is about L.A. or pretty much superhero in L.A. So, quick question, mm -hmm. quick question. It's Is it... <laughs> Brianna is going to uh, probably kick my ass for this one. So it's nothing like The Runaways, right? <laughs> no. Okay. Because they paint, they paint L.A. a little differently, you know, especially with the TV show that just dropped. They paint L.A. very differently mm -hmm. than from what it really is. But 
you know, it's nice. And, uh, and L.A. is a lot of things. That's that's that its beauty and its and its strength, but it also can trip up storytellers if uh, you say, "Oh, I'm gonna set this story here," or "I'm gonna set this story here." I mean, if you can have a great story set in East L.A. or Boyle Heights, but know the history, know that yeah, that's where Latinos live now. But why are they there? You know, um, why was the freeway built separating that part of town from downtown? And why is the Sixth Street Bridge important? You know, you don't have to make that the, the principal part of your storytelling, but knowledge of that can give more profundity to even something that you give fluff to because you'll set the camera at a certain place. And, you know, like as the person who principally writes and illustrates in my books, you know, I'm thinking about that. I'm thinking about the storytelling, where I'm going to place the camera, where this action is going to flow, and therefore, in this background, what do I want to show? What do I want people to see that makes them really feel like they are in this place? Like this story that I'm telling that's completely fantastic could really happen because we have grounded it so well. Okay, that's fantastic. So, uh, we have a couple questions for you, you know, based on what you do. And, Thanks, Gary. Uh, Thanks, Gary. I'm going ask. <laughs> All right. So, we're ready to go. Okay. So, um, I have the first question. When did you first decide that you wanted to create your own comics as a career? Um, not till I was in high school or college. You know, when I was younger, of course, I wanted to uh, illustrate. It was something that I loved to do and something that I thought I was good at. And then I saw Walt Simonson's artwork and it made my brain explode as an elementary school student. And the wow, you can get me to do something like that. And that led me toward comics. And then um, I started to have ideas. Um, Roach is a great example because I first came up with that idea of this anti-hero set in Prohibition at that point in time uh, in my college years. And so I, I just looked around and I, I realized, well, what I have in my head is way outside the stereotype, but everybody who looks at it is going to think, oh, you're ripping off the spirit. Oh, you're ripping off the shadow, which is BS, almost cussed, but I didn't. I left it alone. Mm -hmm. um, and Because most of the folks who do that are critics who never crack it open. And uh, what's so cool about uh, the road is... Um, it's very, very, it's an opportunity to critique social political situations that have continued throughout time, um, but set it in that place. Because sometimes when we talk about stuff in real time, people uh, become very defensive or they are overly sensitive to anything that might seem like them that cast in a negative light. If you place it in another time and say, oh, no, 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 we're not talking about you. Well, we're, we're talking about this group of people. And they go, oh, okay, maybe take in some of that information and a conversation can grow from that. Um, what was cool about the roach, well, number one cool thing about the roach is uh, winning the Glyph Award for that—that that was I won the Anarcho uh, Rising Star Glyph Award for the Roach, which blew my mind because here I am writing. Um, uh, I don't know if y'all can see me. Maybe you can't, but I am black, and uh, <laughs> uh, here I am writing this period piece set in Chicago about a white anti-hero and the arguably the biggest convention that essentially about black characters or black creators is Ekbok in Philly, and they gave me the award for the best indie comic for this story about this white anti-hero. I thought, okay, that, that works. And then a lot of the reviews, one, one great review was by 
a really, really cool guy. Um, and Mike um, said in uh, his review of The Road, um, after I finished it in 2009, it was the best miniseries in all of comics. DC, Marvel, Image, Dark Horse, whatever. My story was the best story. Nice. So this, this is... I, I this is the stuff that, that makes it worthwhile for me. Mm -hmm. And um, it makes it enables me to look at some of the crit the critiques that don't even really read it and say, okay, uh, uh, lady, back in the day when I released Menthu, um, she read, and she was like, oh, here comes another black superhero, and oh, more of the same thing. Oh, yeah, and they said, Egyptian thing, and she really didn't read it, and she she put up her review, and I wrote her back. I said, I don't mind if you like it or you don't like it. I mind that it's obvious to me that you didn't read it. You say you want something new. You say you want something different. Well, here's a father and son story in a superhero book with black principles, and they're adults, and in this issue, Here's a black man embracing his grown black son, kissing him and saying, I love you. Where yeah. else have you seen that again for you to say that this is just like everything else? I, I, I went in and I did six years of research to make sure that I didn't go back and call people Osiris and Isis and all this kind of stuff. I used the Egyptian names. I used the Egyptian places. I made sure that I read some of the old stories so the characterizations of these gods were reflective of what's actually in things like the Book of the Dead and such. And they're there. And you are coming out and telling me that I'm doing just what everybody else has done. Nice. I don't mind it if you go in and you say that I hadn't done it well. That's cool. You're, you're entitled to that. But when you don't read it and you diss it and say in your dissing, gee, I wish it was like what's actually in there. I can tell you didn't read it. And she wrote me back and she apologized and said, you're right. I apologize. I won't do that again. Check her. Check her. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> I have a question. Um, so who has been your biggest influence on you? Who's been the biggest influence on you outside the comic industry? And how did they affect your life? My parents. My parents. Great. Undoubtedly. Um, my um, I'm very much like both of them. Uh, much love to them. I know they're, they're, they both passed away and got nothing but love for what they have done for me in my life. Um, my dad was always very analytical. Um, in fact, my dad is the person who first showed me how to draw. Um, I was three years old and he was doing a schematic or something like that. And uh, I remember he was sitting on a blue sofa and he was drawing something, he was left-handed. And I was looking at him and I asked him what he was doing. And he said, well, I'm drawing something. And he said, would you like to draw something? I said, yeah. And he said, what would you like to draw? Since we live close to uh, about half a block away from a train track, um, I could hear the train going by and I said, I want to draw a choo-choo train. So that was the first thing I ever drew. Um, so my dad, in terms of personality, how I analyze things and such, I got a lot from him. But as far as raw talent, uh, all from my mom. My mom was so talented as a pianist and as a songwriter. She was the uh, mistress of music at my church when I was a boy. Growing up, she would write cantatas, all kinds of stuff, teach music. Phenomenally, phenomenally talented lady. So whatever I got in terms of talent came from her, and whatever I got in terms of trying to do something with the talent, I got from my dad. That's awesome. Thank you very much for that. So, uh, Robert, I just want to ask because that going off that is who is the uh, who would you say probably was the biggest influence on your comic career specifically, and like how did they help you like evolve your work? Oh man. Uh, uh, I mentioned Walt Simonson because he made my head go gooey and oozed out my ears when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. um, I, 
I never really wanted to draw like somebody. It's wild to, for me to say that I love Simon's work because I don't draw anything like him. But uh, I'm, I'm a big, big fan. And, of course, you know, it's the same, the, the Border Police stuff. Uh, 70s through 80s, you're talking about the Neil Adamses and all that kind of stuff. And then, you know, like when, um, when the guys from Marvel split off and create image and everybody is ooing and eyeing over the image way of drawing things. And so it's impossible not to be influenced by folks like that. And um, it's great to have friends in the industry. Um, um, a really good friend of mine is uh, Tera Katia, uh, supreme artist out of Japan. And then, you know, uh, all kinds of folks. I'm like, uh, I'm, I'm going blank as a talking because uh, I, I became friends with uh, one of the guys I'll mention, uh, Paul Smith. Uh, you, any of you X Men fans know his stuff from way, way, way back in the day. I, I ran into him in, in the 80s. I ran into him at a, um, uh, at a convention to get some feedback. And he was very, very helpful, turned me on to Andrew Loomis, who really enabled me to uh, develop my anatomy and that kind of stuff. Um, I was a big fan going up of Mike Grell when he was doing the Warlord and stuff like that. And uh, what's wild is um, I grew up, I was in elementary and uh, junior high, high school and stuff before the internet existed, before we even thought the internet could exist. And somehow, I can't even remember how I did it, but I tracked down Mike Grell's phone number when he lived in Wisconsin. And as a kid, I called him and like he said, this is my first hand phone call. And uh, but I had some sense. I didn't become a burden or a bother to him. And I would just send him a postcard or something like that every two or three years. Uh, so that when I finally caught up with him, um, it was while it was, uh, he, I waited in line with nothing to sign. And, um, uh, when I got up front, he said, well, you know, you didn't have to wait in line just to talk to me. I said, well, I've waited longer to meet you. He said, well, who are you? And I was hemming and hawing and couldn't get it out. And then he said, no, no, what's your name? I said, Robert Roach. And he stood up, he shook my hand and says, Damn, it's good to meet you after all these years. So I was like, okay, that that, that was nice. <laughs> so so um, great guys that have helped me develop. Um, uh, Gary Gianni, uh, I consider Gary a friend. He was very very helpful as I tried to develop. Um, I worked uh, at Malibu inside the uh, offices as a cleanup artist and such, and the guys there helped me out. I'm still friends with them. Uh, so I can't say that I wanted to be like somebody in the industry. I just wanted to be as professional as I possibly could be. I wanted to tell stories as well as I possibly could. And a bunch of these folks, since I am principally self-taught, a bunch of these, fo of these folks helped me do exactly this. Nice. Great to see. So please, please know that, uh, you know, I, I, I hope that anybody who's listening or watching, uh, Go up and talk to people in Art of Delhi. Go up there, you know, go with a good attitude. Know that you have two ears and one mouth, so you should listen twice as much. <laughs> <laughs> but I guarantee you, 90 to 95% of the people there are really, really cool. And unless they're really busy or really, really tired, they're going to be nice to you and give you positive feedback. Now, if you act like you know everything, uh, they're going to look like you just walked off the house with mud on your shoes. <laughs> but if, if you if you know how to act, you're gonna get really cool feedback. So so don't be afraid to go up and talk to people. I, whenever somebody comes over to me and says, Oh, I like to draw, I immediately say, Well let me see what you got. Hmm. And they say, I didn't I left it at home. I did don't do that. Don't be afraid. Hmm. The only thing you can get is information that can help you improve you. So um, you said six years of research. So what do you do when you need to recharge your creative battery? See somebody else's creative stuff. <laughs> That's the way for me to do it, man. I mean, I, uh, man, I mean, there's so much creativity around us. Uh, and sometimes when you're working on stuff, you get tunnel vision, and 
and you're just there and you need to get up and step away and see somebody else do something well. And I applaud someone else's effort. That helps me recharge and get myself right. Nice. nice. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, again, you uh, back uh, hopping off on hopping on. Uh, Bree's question, you said six years of research. So like when you're going into something, can you describe your work routine? Like how is, you know, what do you do? You know, tunnel vision or do you try to like soak in things from everywhere else? You know, what, what's your work routine like? Whether it's your comics or, you know, storyboarding. Um, I think, well, I know. My routine uh, depends on the demands of the job. Okay. And the job is the bottom line. Uh, there have been times when I've had to work 18 hours because the turnaround is really tight and you have to grind. Um, but you also, within that grind, need to know that if you're getting diminished returns from trying to make that effort, step away. It's good. I tell students all the time, get up, walk away for five minutes. Uh, great example. Um, it's very easy, especially if you're just beginning as a board artist, to start to draw everything from the same perspective. Everything is here in front of you at about three quarter, and the camera is just set in the static place. It's sort of like uh, Wes Anderson, and you're just stuck there forever. Uh, <laughs> that's not a diss. I, I love his storytelling. So um, get up and walk away. But when you need to draw this, why don't you sit on the floor? Because where you position yourself will inform the art that you're executing. Mm. And so uh, maybe if I sit on the floor, I'm going to start to draw an up angle. And all of a sudden, uh, everything is going to change and the storytelling will get stronger. And then I'll have newer thoughts and my flow picks up again. Um, that's one way to address stuff. Um, take in all kinds of information from everywhere. That doesn't mean use everything. That means have this store of knowledge so that your storytelling can become more precise. So that's how I approach what I do. Same thing, oh. if you were writing, I would say understand grammar, understand vocabulary, understand cadence, understand how people talk as opposed to what your thesaurus may tell you. And apply this, you know, Shakespeare was a great writer, not because he wrote properly every time. He knew the rules he was breaking and how he was breaking them and purpose for it. Understand anatomy. If you're going to change something and, or break a rule, break it from knowledge. If you're going to play with perspective and you're going to warp something or you're going to twist something, uh, draw something that's really not applicable to reality, but it works in the storytelling, having that as your base in terms of knowledge enables you to work from strength towards strength. Hmm. Huh. Going off that, Robert, I actually want to ask you too, is because like just going on you like your art and your uh, writing, you've done like all that, you've done coloring, lettering, inking, I've seen penciling, I see all of that. So, and I see it, just going off that, you, I see a drawing board behind you. Like, I, yeah, I want to know like what kind of, all the to like what tools do you use like what do you you have a specific things that you use for your like when you're creating a comic on what different different parts or do you just use it like do you stick to the drawing board i just like what tools do you use um i'm glad that you use the word uh tool ziggy because that's exactly what i refer how i refer to everything mm -hmm. uh pencil is a tool an eraser is a tool stylus is a tool Computer is a tool, Photoshop is a tool, Illustrator is a tool. They're all tools. Mm -hmm. And some tools have a number of different applications. Some tools only have one application. So it could be that that one application kicks much ass and it's irreplaceable. It could be that the multi-use of a different tool makes it irreplaceable. Uh, so uh, similar to my answer before in terms of my work, as far as tools are concerned, it depends what my uh, what the artwork dictates. 
for example, if I'm doing work on the roach, that's all of my artwork. It's everything from the from the story's beginning to when it goes to uh, a printer is me. And so to execute the roach, I definitely work in Fude Pen. Uh, do you guys know what a Fude Pen is? I don't know. I do not. No. I don't. No. Okay, a Fude Pen is, okay, cool. Fine. <laughs> Uh, Y'all ain't stupid because you don't know what a fude pen is. That's <laughs> not uh, a fude pen is a Japanese calligraphy brush. Oh. And um, I'm lucky my sister-in-law uh, will ship them to me from Japan every once in a while. And so I can get really precise uh, uh, feathering. And it's very, very easy to do what I call an organic line. Uh, going from thin to fat, uh, to fat to thin again and curvaceous and all that kind of stuff. It really allows me to go in with precision uh, since I'm working in finished inks in that, using microns, uh, rapido graphs, pulpic pens of various sizes and such. But to finish everything else off, I have to take it into uh, Photoshop and I work with a variety of textures, and black and white is so much harder than color. A lot of people will look at Menthu and the roach and they'll say, oh man, the roach took no time. Said, man, the roach takes three times more effort than <laughs> Menthu does. Uh, because if you think about it for a second, I don't have the uh, luxury of putting blue next to red and your eye seeing the difference. Mm. I'm putting gray next to gray. And so what is the difference? Is the difference too much? If is, is it too little? I'm going to have to be consistent with this gray throughout this book. So when I put it next to another gray, how are they going to work? And how are these textures working with the tone, with the grayscale tone that we're putting down and these types of things? A lot of considerations have to go into that artwork. Whereas um, Benthu, uh Nowadays, I just do the pencils. Larry does the inks. Le again, Larry Welch, excellent illustrator. He's been like a rash throughout the uh, comics industry since the early 90s. And a younger guy, uh, Corey Green out of Chicago, does the colors. So I don't have to do all of that. So I just work with my pencil on that. Um, I I'm working on another project. It may uh, be developed into uh, a comic book miniseries, but it's called Lion of Judah. And with Lion of Judah, I am doing, uh, well, Lion of Judah talks about uh, the post colonial uh, Africa and Caribbean world um, and goes back uh, probably about a century talking about. Africa as it was then, uh, the development of certain countries there. Ethiopia is very, very big in the storyline, but it's done through the prism of reggae and the original whalers. So Bob Marley's in there, um, uh, Bunny Whaler's in there, uh, Peter is in there, so um, the originals are there, and in fact we the guy who wrote it, his name is Menelik Makar, um, did a wonderful job as far as the scripts are concerned, and he's the one that brought me on board. Uh, and in terms of it as a um, TV production, they asked me to do the concept designs. And so uh, we're taking moments that there isn't any visuals for. Uh, for example, when... Um, when Bunny, Peter, and Bob were in, um, when they were selling books at in Jamaica, their own record store called Whalem Solem. Like, there aren't any pictures of Whalem Solem. Uh, but getting photographs, reference for them at that age, and then drawing uh, them with uh, Rita, who would ride around the island with the pressed records in her bot and her um, her bicycle basket, 
selling them to stores and DJs and stuff. And so getting that, what was really, really rewarding about that is uh, when we put that illustration up, um, Bunny responded and said, it's like I'm seeing my, my, my history. And, mm -hmm. and Bob's children with Rita saw it and they said, that's my mama. And, you know, so grasping that and putting that together, I, it, I think it really has a lot of potential uh, as a comic. Um, Menelik's uh, script is really on point, really bringing out a lot of stuff, a lot of history that's overlooked. Um, the OAU, as far as the uh, African unity, uh, that was uh, countries that were founded in, what was it, 62, 63? Um, Haile Selassie, and, and it's interesting that Haile Selassie is the core and, and a pivotal character in terms of Rastafari, and reggae and Rastafari are not the same thing. A lot of people confuse them and conflate them, but they aren't. And then also go into uh, Ethiopia and the war against um, Italy in the late 30s, uh, how all that went down with the League of Nations, the League of Nations ignoring Ethiopia when they said this is not right, and but Ethiopia with uh, British help also repulsing the Italians eventually. And it's interesting, we're really trying to be accurate with everything, and we talk about uh, Rastafari, but we also talk about um, the Coptic religion. And it's interesting that a lot of people think that uh, Catholicism is the oldest Christian organization still in existence. It is not. The Coptic Christian uh, faith precedes uh, what happened in Rome by about three decades. And a lot of that stuff is still in existence there in Ethiopia, like uh, Lalabella, the, the uh, churches that are hewn out of stone there. So, so all of this including the geopolitics of it all, you know, like what was happening in the Kennedy White House, what was happening in Britain at this time period. It all goes into Line of Judah as a storytelling tool, but uh, it's done through the prism of popularity of uh, Bob, Peter, and Bunny, uh, the Whalers, the emergence of uh, reggae, and what is done as uh, a world power since. Wow. So um, you do a lot, put a lot of work into your comics, including research and stuff. What element yes. of your work gives you the most personal satisfaction? Nailing the storytelling. Uh, if you tell a story well and it resonates with people, that's most satisfying for me. Um, I would like to get rich with it too. <laughs> Not uh, and so that's one B, but one A, and I think you have to have one A before one B, especially if you're an indie. I don't have the luxury of saying, uh, well, you know, DC is, is underwriting this, so we don't have to worry about the numbers. We do have to worry about the numbers. But also, as you guys said before, there are times when, uh, those comics are really, really well done, and it's very exciting. And there are times when they can slide. Um, we can't let stuff slide if we're doing it ourselves. Yeah, and right. therefore, I, I try to make sure that this is uh, my principal goal, and hopefully by executing this principal goal well, the one B with the money will eventually come. I'm sure you guys will help with that. Everybody who watches this and listens to it will be like, ooh, I got to buy his books. Oh, yeah. I got to buy his books. Yeah. <laughs> Do it. Definitely. Definitely. Let me take a look. Yeah, hopefully we can help mm -hmm. with that. But, um, you know, with all the research and all the work that you've done, you know, you know, with Menthe, The Roach, and, you know, what you're currently working on, Line of uh, Judah, um, what would you say is the mm -hmm. most rewarding project in your professional career, whether it's in comics or out of comics? And why? Ooh. In comics, uh, I'd have to say The Roach uh, for the reasons I've, I've mentioned before. Um, uh, in, in that first, uh, in that 
four issue arc, and I'm doing another uh, arc. Lord have mercy on me, please. Let me get <laughs> uh, um, uh, I I had opportunities. I knew that the Roach was going to be popular when I was in college, and I, I played football when I was in college. Uh, and um, my senior year, well, the Roach was in the literary magazines that uh, Butler University. Shout out to Butler University, Indianapolis Bulldogs. Um, <laughs> Um, I I got strong armed into writing for uh, Butler's literary magazine called Manuscripts because the advisor for Manuscripts was also my uh, advanced creative writing teacher, and I wrote a story. He liked it, and he he just gave it directly to the editor who was in the class. So it just it just ran, and I was like, okay, whatever. It became the most popular thing in that issue. Uh, manuscripts would come out once every semester. So I had him again for another class the next semester, and I realized, well, he really likes his character a lot, so it's an easy A. So, uh, but I worked hard. I, I put together a good story. I wrote it. Ends up in manuscripts. Now, that was it. I was done with English as uh, a cognitive uh, discipline as far as my major was concerned. And I was living off campus my senior year. I was like, I'm done with this stuff. I So <laughs> I, was, I was walking across uh, the quad and I, I hear somebody hollering my name and I look back and it was a friend of mine named Jennifer. She used to date a friend of mine and uh, she's catching up. She says, I'm, I'm the editor for manuscripts this year. I said, well, congratulations. That's lovely for you. And she said, I need you to write another story about the roach. I'm like, Jennifer, I'm done with English. I'm, I'm not, I'm, this is my fun year. I'm not trying. <laughs> and she said, please, 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 and please, and personal, please. And then, and then. So I said, okay, I'll tell you what. If a good story comes to mind, I'll write it, but I can't guarantee anything. I had a great thought. It was fun. I was playing with uh, past and present tense and the uh, narrative voice and all that kind of stuff. It came together. People liked it, so I did that. And she said, "Robert, you have to try it. One more story now. You got to, you Mike. Know, this is last semester here." So I wrote one that was a cliffhanger. Fast forward to when it was published, and I'm in the cafeteria, and there's, you know, how people will segregate themselves, and so football players were at this big table by themselves, and I walked up, and they're like, "Okay, okay," and they're, they're discussing stuff. I'm like, hey, what's up? What's up? They say, okay, Robert, you can answer this. I'm like, what? Does the roach live or die? I'm like, <laughs> what? <laughs> and I'm like, uh, I said, well, what do you guys think? And like half the table is like, he lived. Does it this and this and this? And then the other guys were like, no, he wrote in here that this, and he got shot. And, this, and these guys are arguing. There's a dozen football players arguing on whether this character lives or dies in a literary magazine for our school. I was like, there's something to this character that resonates. Nice. And, yes. <laughs> uh, and uh, so uh, he doesn't, because I have to tell more stories. But uh, he does get hurt badly, mm. but he, he survives. Okay. And that's one cool <laughs> thing about the approach is he's mortal. And I show that he's mortal. I, and as you can tell, where you are in the storyline because I allow him to have more and more scars as he goes on because he's at he's in a dangerous line of, of well it's not work he's going to be free but um, I, I knew that I had a decent character but I'm a black man and I wanted some of my culture also in this thing that I thought would be well received and so just what was cool about that first arc is I was able to infuse uh, a character and a storyline that dealt with uh, black soldiers in World War I. Uh, we think about the Tuskegee Airmen, we think about Buffalo Soldiers and Civil War, but people forget that blacks fought with valor in World War I. And in fact, uh, a number of the black units in France, won because they fought for the French there, won the highest awards from the French army than anybody. And so uh, I was able to 
who's a character who saves the ropes. The ropes gets shot, and he's really in a bad situation, and he's saved by a former soldier in the midst of this gunfight. And it at least allowed me to infuse some of this type of history and while we're still enjoying uh, the entertainment area of it all. So as far as comics are concerned, that would be uh, my biggest pride and joy so far. Um, in terms of the entertainment industry, uh, the things that I've done and I'm really, really proud of, uh, it's hard to talk about. Other than Line of Judah, I'm really, really pleased with it. But um, I've done stuff in the past, and it hasn't been produced. Uh, I, I did. Uh, I was uh, one of the main storyboard artists on a uh, feature animation. In fact, I did the last 30% of the movie and the climax and all that kind of stuff and turned it in, and the guys still haven't finished it. Um, did some really, really cool live action boards for a mini series uh, that's like a mashup between. Uh, Death Race 2000 and 24, and it's really, really cool. Um, they haven't produced it. So that's the bad side about the entertainment industry is you can do your job really well, but after you hand it to the next person in that uh, chain of development, mm -hmm. if they drop their ball, then, no. well, you, at least you got you got your check. That's all you can say. Right, right. Right enough. I have two questions, Robert. First, just mark me. What was your major in college, by the way? Uh, my major was in public and corporate communications. I, I used to tell my uh, my advisor there, uh, big love to uh, Miss Johnson, or I used to call her Miss J. Um, uh, I used to tell her I'm getting a BS in BS. <laughs> so yeah, that that was, that was my major. That's super cool. That's, a, that's so that's super cool because it's. Like it's so interesting to see that like you found your like you went for one thing, but then you found what you, your passion or you went to do, and that's the one things I like kind of want to highlight with the second question is like for those newcomers that are just their first projects coming up, their first their first big break is what advice would you give them like if they're just going into it and they're like they're just trying to do their best. Uh, know yourself. Um. Question yourself uh, be, and, and be honest with yourself. Um, know the circumstances of the storytelling you're about to execute. Um, don't be afraid to get input from other people. Not everybody who's trying to give you advice is trying to take over your project. And at the same time, there are some people who are doing that. Know how to tell people no. Um, uh, be humble, but not afraid. Um, I uh, I think I do what I do fairly well, but I know that there are hundreds, if not thousands, of people who also do it very well, and so when someone steps to me like uh, they stank, uh, like they they stuffed the own stank, I'd say I didn't cuss again. Uh, <laughs> uh, then I got a problem with you because I got a portfolio full of stuff that I can pull out on your ass. Um, but at the same time, if you are coming to me and asking for input and you act like you've been there before and you're going to be there again, um, I'm more than happy to spend as much time as I possibly can with you. And so uh, have some discernment because this type of discernment will enable you to turn something around really nicely. And uh, you might be able to holler at some people if you have comported yourself well, that'll help you out with some of your storytelling. Um, I had a, a student of mine who um, this was years ago at Otis, and um, she had no intention of really being a board artist, and she made that very, very clear. Uh, but she wanted <laughs> to get into the, the magazine industry and really become an art director and such there. Uh, 
So I was surprised when it was time for her portfolio to be executed, and she asked me to be uh, the faculty, uh, the, the instructor overseeing that development. And um, my suggestion to her was, since you want to be in the magazine industry in this capacity, uh, why don't we create a magazine showing what you can do in terms of layout and these types of things? And um, she had taken a trip to Cuba and had photographs from there and said, why don't we use that, uh, almost like a travel log, to show what you can do. And as we were working on it, she ran into uh, creative block. And the way that I got it out of her, I got her out of it, I said, okay, I know you hate it, but go back to storyboarding. Think about what we tried to do in storyboarding. Think about how you're trying to lay this out. Maybe the problem on this page isn't on this page. Maybe it's on the prior page or the upcoming page. And if we fix that problem, then the problems on this page will be fixed and our flow will be resumed. And she did that. She did well. You know, like fast forward uh, about a decade later, I saw her on LinkedIn or she gave me a shout out and she's a senior uh, art editor at a magazine on the East Coast. So we don't be afraid to take all of that information from a variety of places that will help you develop your story well, because it's about the story at the end of the line. It's about the story. Well, you seem very experienced. And um, I was wondering, like, what's the most important big idea that you've learned in life overall in or out of comics and why you think that is the big idea and why it's important? Uh, I think, uh, uh, I don't know if this is the biggest idea I know, but I, I know that it's timely. Um, not everybody who disagrees with you dislikes you. Uh, we, we live in a world right now where if I disagree with you, I am automatically seen as your enemy. And that's one of the most ignorant things, most ignorant ways to approach life. You, you, it's just stupid. Um, I don't even agree with my own damn self all the time. So how can I make, expect somebody to agree with me all the time when I can't do that with myself. And if we can get to the point where we can say, I don't agree with you on that, but that's okay. Because you probably don't agree with me on something. And I hope that's okay with you. And, and, and do that and you like say, cool. Well, then what's the next conversation we're going to have? Oh, well, let's talk about sports. Let's talk about if we could have that degree of decorum and civility, um, that would be better. And it starts off by saying, hey, I don't have every answer. I'm conflicted on a lot of things. Why wouldn't that be expected in someone else? Why do I expect perfection in someone else when I don't demand it of myself? And if we can look at whatever you believe. It could be religion, it could be lack of religion, it could be politics, it could be social strata, it could be whatever. Um, but if we could start to uh, check out our own selves first, like smell your own funk first before you start talking to somebody, you know, like <laughs> start talking to somebody else about their funk, you know? Uh, it's great, like, don't talk about somebody else's toothpick in their eye when you got a big two by four sticking out of yours. Right. No, come on now, come on. I think that's if we started it there, then people who are atheists and agnostic and of faith and all the kind of stuff can really get along. You know, like uh, I am deeply involved in my faith. <clears throat> However, I have a friend who's atheist. We're good friends. We have great conversations. We have, have very thoughtful things to say to and from each other, and we love each other. I was there. Uh, in fact, we were at Comic-Con, um, 
and I'm, I'm going to get a little emotional, but we were at Comic Con tearing down my booth from Artist Alley when he got the phone call that his dad had passed away. And, you know, what do you say to a brother? I've, I've had that experience, and I know what that feels like. I know the profundity of that, you know. And all I could say to you, man, is I love you and I'm praying for you. And he said to me, Robert, I know what you mean, and I can accept that from you. That's it. I didn't have to say anything more to him. That's what he needed to hear. He knew I was his friend. Why can't we just be like this? That that's what that's what I think it is. Wow, that's uh <clears throat> that was kind of deep. But uh yeah. Uh you know, uh last you asked question. you to be deep. What you want? Me? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I went outside, I slipped a bus in my ass. <laughs> no? No, nah, that that was really profound. That was really profound, and I appreciate that that um answer to that question. I really do. Um, I have one more question. If no one else has any questions, I have a, a last question for you. Is um so at the end of it, Robert, uh, where do you see men through the roach um even line of Judah? Where do you where do you see all of your work going? Like, do you expect to see it? You know, ten twenty years from now, do you expect to see like an adaptation somewhere from all your work or do you expect to see a lot of uh, african-american kids say hey man look this is what i'm reading now like okay yeah i used to read dc when i was a lot younger or you know my my parents introduced me to dc but this is where i'm at now and this is what i'd rather be reading you know where do you see your work going and who do you, and do you really want it to touch you know everyone differently or however you want everyone to pull whatever you want uh, they pull they pull from that and it, uh that's really, I've never, I've never heard that question. So very, very cool. Thank you for making me think of it. <laughs> uh, I, I would like a lot of the things that you said, and I'll, I'll piggyback on them. I would like uh, for a number of people to be able to enjoy what I do. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, in various media, um, I have had some people come to me and say, hey, can we develop this this way or that way? And you're like, we'll see where it goes. Um, I'll, I'll keep you informed. Um, and that's great. Um, I, I appreciate the passion that the African-American audience has for Menthu because, uh, as I've mentioned, a lot of what I've done in the book it's not being seen elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, however, it's also interesting to me that a good 70% of the audience for the book is non-black. Wow. And it's interesting that, yes, you too, baby. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and, and I hope that is, you know, like some things get really black. It's very black. And you, if, you can feel exclusory, and I don't want that. I want to feel. I want it to be inclusive. I love people to come to my cookout. If you know how to act, just mm -hmm. come and act, enjoy the cookout. You know, and if you don't know how to act, I don't care if you're black too. You got to leave. You don't know how to play. <laughs> you don't have to play spades even. Yeah, you got to leave. I'm not even no fit with. You don't even know how to play spades. You got to leave the cookout. <laughs> so, uh, you know, like I want it to be inclusive in this matter. Um, and yeah, I do want other people checking it out. I, I appreciate you mentioning it that way because I've had stupendous writers and artists come to me and say, hey man, can I play around with Menthu? I'm like, yeah. I mean, when you have a guy like Jeff Thorne, who was one of the principal writers on The Librarians back in the day, on mm -hmm. Leverage, who's doing, uh, who's the head writer on a Marvel Animation Project, uh, who cracked into the industry by coming in, and he didn't win the grand prize. I think he got first prize in a Star Trek novella contest back in the day. And like that's, he comes up and says, "Hey, can I play around with Menthu?" He said, "Yeah." That it resonates enough for professionals like him, professionals like Hannibal. A friend of mine named Andre Owens, who uh, runs uh, Hero Unlimited Comics, another indie. These folks, Todd Harris, a real good friend of mine, concept artist, storyboard artist, 
was one of the storyboard artists on uh, Thor Ragnarok. Coming over and say, hey, can I play around with men too? No. Hell yeah. <laughs> you know? So, and uh, uh, Brianna, they did the work in number seven, the black and white story. That was really cool. Yes. Didn't they kick ass with that? And it they was did. It was really like, like it was, it was really pretty. Like, uh huh. I just yeah. really like. <laughs> Thank you. And then I did the backup story, the one that's all color and uh, with the Akkadian gods fighting the Egyptian gods. I mean, it just worked. You know, when, when you have people like that who say um, the creative commodity you're making resonates with me, uh, then I think I've done something well. And I just hope that I, we can stay around long enough and we can gain enough momentum and enough uh, financial and critical acclaim to continue doing it. I think that uh, what you mentioned Mukhtar, will definitely happen because it's just gotten such a wave going forward. Same thing with the Roach. I've had, I mean, Jeff wants to do stuff on the Roach. A friend of mine, Dale Wilson, would like to write a story with the Roach. The fact that other creators whom I highly respect want to play around with it, or um, I have a, a black barbarian thing that I'm doing set in prehistory. He's called Ethereal. And I have guys like Hannibal and a different writer friend named Thaddeus Howes and, and Jeff coming up and say, hey, can we play around with that? It encourages me to think that creative commodity is strong and entertaining uh, we just have to make sure that more people know about it and we can move stuff right hopefully we can do our part here on earth too to help you move I, stuff, I'm, but... I'm honored by the opportunity oh no thank you honored. very much for coming on the show i mean again it's not like you know you're already there with the um acclaim and the awards you know my um uh, my camera sky has you know uh did a review on the roach um you won the glyph for the roach uh tony isabella did a review for the roach so you, you know the acclaim is already there also um james mishler did a review for menthu so the acclaim is already there you know we're just you know at this point we're looking forward to what comes next and hopefully you know this what we've done hopefully what we've done yes hopefully what we've done here you know can help you know and you know this is it's really really awesome i'm really sure brian is like excited to have you and ask all the questions ziggy also and myself you know most definitely thank you so much yes yeah, thank you very much because you, you have given us a lot to think about and uh i hope the listeners and you know people who be watching this also have a lot to think about also um there's a little surprise because i was talking to robert you know via email and you know we might be doing a giveaway of one of his books for a lucky listener and you know hopefully with that you'll be able to look into what he's done and you know go go forward and support more of his work again i want to thank you very much robert for coming on and you know telling us your story and telling us how you started and telling us where you are right now and you know walking us through the men through the roach and also what you know all the stuff coming up next i really really do appreciate your you know you you know you taking the time to come on earth too um Brianna and Ziggy, I'm sure appreciate it. Do you have any words you have to, you want to say to Robert before we sign out? Oh, like always, thank you, man. Uh, I feel like you, thanking us. I we, you're the star here, so thank you for being <laughs> on the show. And everybody, read his stuff, try it out. Go out and read new stuff. Get out of your comfort zone. Do new stuff. That's the only way how we can grow this kind of stuff is if we try new things. So right. make Robert one of them. Make Robert's stuff one of them. Right. Great. Um, I mean, they've all, all already said it. Thank you, and I like I love Menthu, so keep writing. Please. Thank you very much. No, thank you. Wait, wait till you see. Wait, uh, you didn't pick up uh, the anger of angels, but when you have a demigod, an angry angel, and a demon all together, oh man! I'm so excited. <laughs> I'm gonna yeah, stop. No. I know Bo Ziggy's knows how much I love God I know God Ziggy's going to pick so that much. one because he loves God said it, I, was, I, I love it so much. I appreciate uh, it. It's like no one research done into it. So I'm, I'm looking forward to it. The right. research is very like obvious in the story, though. Like I did not know that like the names I already knew were just Greek versions of the names. And like yeah. I, I read a lot of mythology when I was younger, and I didn't know that. So it's really cool. 
They'll love you, though, Don. Don't worry about that. <laughs> great, great. So you you hear us gushing about you know you know the stuff. I know um, Bree for one has read. You no, know, was at the uh, convention and she met him and she read the stuff. So she knows firsthand. And we're all gonna get into it. So thank you again, Robert, for taking the time. Again, your story is really awesome. Um, we're looking forward to see more stuff from you. Hopefully, we can have you come back we'll again and share, you know, new stuff when we have new stuff. Um, again, that Earth would be my all right. Uh, down in the description um, box or description bar, we're gonna find. We're gonna, I'm gonna drop all his information, everything that I have, even the rewards and the claims uh, from yes. Mr. Robert. I'm gonna drop everything down there for you guys where you can find him. He's on Twitter. His on Instagram, all those will be down there in the description bar. Again, you can listen to Earth 2's um, This Week in Comics podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, uh, Podbean, Podcast, TuneIn, Google Play Music, wherever you find your podcast at, you can, you, you, you can listen to us there. Uh, YouTube, Earth 2 Comicast, and the website, Earth2CC.com. I'm going to have a lot of information off this interview coming for you, so please, please, please expect a lot. And again, support Earth 2 and Earth 2, um, listeners of Earth 2, fans of Earth 2, support Robert Roach because he's doing great work. Again, this is uh, Black History Month, this week in comics special. Um, thank you guys for listening. We will catch you on the next one. We're out. Peace. Bye, people.